So, uh, Josh, you're working at the university and uh, heading a, a unit of translational research. So, is that classical translating research into clinical application, or is there more to the translation? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a good question. So, yeah, so I'm at you know I'm at UCSF in San Francisco, uh, except for right now when I'm in Ireland. Um, and you know, uh, we Tripper is what we call the acronym. Um, which you know, we thought was kind of clever. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> uh, but we are dedicated to translational research. And the way we see that is to try and uh, trans, we're translating all the time, but trying to take the information that we've learned, say from animal work for the most part, and translating that, that into human applications. And also taking what we've learned um, for, from, from example, like, uh, in, you know, anthropology or epidemiology into trials in humans. And then also translating what we've learned from trials and healthy people into clinical applications. Uh, and then the data we get from clinical applications, hopefully the, the eventual goal is to translate that into you know, uh, implementation. Like how do we actually, you know, once we've figured out if and how it works in a small scale, how do we actually roll this out for you know, the people uh, in a sustainable way? Yeah, yeah. So before we come to the mushrooms and the active ingredients and the entourage questions and so on, how did the two of you get into that special field of research? I mean, if yeah. you're in the bubble, it doesn't seem odd anymore at, at some, yeah, some point right. in time. But, but but I think it's interesting for our audience to know how did you get into it? Josh, do you want to begin? Sure. Yeah. So so I was already a faculty member at UCSF um, studying psychopharmacology. I was uh, studying oxytocin actually, which is a, a neuropeptide. We give it intranasally. I say that oxytocin was my gateway drug. Uh, even though there's no subjective effects with the oxytocin, it's it's pretty boring, really. Um, you know, we were doing studies, and we, you know, there does seem to be some effects of oxytocin on social behavior and uh, bonding and such. Um, and we were actually doing some work where we were trying to see if oxytocin could enhance uh, psychotherapy. So we were delivering psychotherapy for a substance use disorder, and we were randomizing people to either get oxytocin or placebo. Um, and maybe it, there was some interesting data there, but, but uh, while I was doing that, I met a, um, a rich person, um, uh, George Sarlo, who, who was featured in the New York Times, uh, I think last year. Uh, he's a Holocaust survivor and um, he, was, he, he was in his eighties and he was telling us about how psychedelics had been a treatment for him, uh, whereas decades of other treatments hadn't worked for his you know, severe PTSD from when he was a child. Um, and I had, you know, already read some of the literature on this and, you know, MDMA may cause oxytocin release. So, you know, I was already kind of interested in this and my lab was already set up to do pharmacologically enhanced psychotherapy. Um, and I, I was really interested and I was like, oh yeah, we would love to do this work. We have a bunch of ideas and, you know, he helped us raise some money. We raised, we ran a, a trial of psilocybin assisted group therapy, um, which we published, uh, I guess that was in 2020 now. So, um, yeah. um, and uh, you know, one thing led to another, and now I would say 90% of what I do, research-wise, uh, is psychedelic-related. Um, yeah, so that's how I got to do it, sort of through uh, academic biological psychiatry, not through Burning Man. Nothing, nothing wrong with coming to it through Burning Man. It's just. I, I can't, I was, I was square and I, frankly, That's I look good, around yeah. and I think, how did I end up being the guy? How did I end up being the psychedelic researcher? Like, you know, it was never, this was not my lifelong passion, but I've gotten very excited about it. And I think there's a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. We, we have different stories of how people come into the field and we hear more of these sober and also patient related stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. good. So uh, here in Germany, we're in the middle of a 144 patient uh, psilocybin trial. We are a part of it. And, and uh, like psychiatry is only uh, like warming up to the idea of these crazy drugs uh, coming into, into the field. And uh, so it's very interesting to ask people how they got into into it. So, so Ben, you you have a you have a story of your own. You you, you were in the extraction business before. You got mm -hmm. into psychedelics. So, what was the door that opened for you? 
Um, I think the 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 door um, was for me. I remember um, watching a documentary on the um, 2016 Imperial College London study uh, and watching the interviews of the people that had been in that study um, and being very affected by the way that they describe their experiences, um, like severely tr treatment resistant um, depression patients um, and, and having like a, an amazing coincidence having only that year sold a a company dedicated to making botanical extracts and thinking, well, I, I mean, I can make three phone calls and all the best people in the world to, to do this kind of thing and make these kind of substances naturally. We can have a company and we can do it all day long. Um, and uh, that that's kind of how it happened. That's how it happened for me. I, and what, what was what, what was really great, like I mentioned, was the chance, you know, we after the cyclopamine company, the company that we had was dedicated mostly to making ingredients for dietary supplements, a little bit of pharma, a little bit of cosmetics, a little bit of food ingredients, but mostly dietary supplements. And frankly speaking, not a lot of those uh, supplements have very good clinical uh, high quality efficacy uh, data or proof. Um, and while we were very happy with our business because we had a way of making these ingredients better and cleaner and cheaper, um, we, you know, none of us, at the company consumed any supplements. Like we weren't really like supplement believers, um, but that's totally different now. So working on using all the knowledge that we gained making products that we didn't really believe in the efficacy and then applying it to products where we, you know, we really truly believe in the efficacy and, and the results uh, speak for themselves. So we, we joke that like the, the mushroom uh, put us through a, a training course, uh, you know, for 10, 15 years, we had to work on things that we didn't really like or believe in, and then all to prepare us so that we could finally work on the mushroom itself. So that's our sort of, our sort of okay, joke yeah. here. So the mushroom is, uh, is uh, personalized a lot in the, in the history of the mushroom. Yeah. So let's talk <laughs> yeah. about the, the spirit, the spirit of the mushroom a little bit later, but um as I understand it, you are developing something that you call a botanical drug candidate. Yeah. So what is a botanical drug candidate? Which upsides and downsides does it have? That's a very good question. And it's one that we that we get a lot. Um, so there, there's, I think, two definitions that we need to make clear. Uh, what does what what does it mean when we talk about natural? And what does it mean when we talk about botanical? Because they are related but distinct. In fact, Botanical is a subcategory of natural. So when, when we say something's natural, when we say that as a drug is natural, we mean only that it comes from a natural source, right? Um, uh, it could be caffeine extracted from the, the coffee bean. Uh, it could be cyclopamine extracted from the Veratrum californicum. It could be paclitaxel, which is a, a cancer drug. Um, but those compounds that I, that I mentioned, they are, are typically all uh, isolated uh, for pharmaceutical application. So what that means is they're purified up to 99% pure, right? So you extract the, it, if you were to make, you know, isolated natural psilocybin, you would extract the psilocybin from the mushroom and then you'd use various procedures and techniques to purify it so that you would remove everything else from the extract. Um, so you would have natural psilocybin, but you wouldn't have botanical psilocybin. Botanical drugs are different than natural because they are required to contain multiple elements from the raw material. Um, again, using the magic mushroom uh, as, as an example, we know that there are multiple active metabolites in the magic mushroom. There's psilocybin, psilocin, baocystin, norbaocystin, um, other tryptamines. Um, and when you make a botanical drug, you, you actually need to keep the entire complement of all those different actives in your final product, as well as actually some of the, um, you know, mushroom substances that are inactive. Uh, if you purify and isolate the psilocybin, your drug is no longer considered, considered to be a botanical product. Now, why, why do this, right? Why not just isolate the, 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 the psilocybin? Well, in our view, if we isolate the psilocybin, there's really nothing, there's no evidence to suggest that 
natural isolated psilocybin will be any different than synthetic isolated psilocybin. Yeah, the 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 one percent or the point one percent will be quite different, uh, but the ninety nine percent will be pretty much exactly the same, right? But with a, with a product like ours, we can actually hope to show that because we have all these other compounds that are still in the final product, um, that we can perhaps demonstrate that they all work together uh, to provide an efficacy benefit over just the isolated compound. People report again with cannabis, right? Look at the success of naturally extracted um, uh, 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 cannabis drugs versus synthetic cannabis, uh, synthetic THC, dronabinol, marinol uh, versus epidiolex, for instance, right? People report that they prefer natural products over synthesized isolated products. We don't know whether these effects, frankly, we don't know whether um, we're going to be able to prove them or, or whether um, they actually exist. Um, but the point is, until someone actually makes a botanical drug, it's impossible to actually go out and, uh, and search for, uh, for the evidence. You mentioned the, the positives and the downsides. So th those, are the, th th those, those are the benefits. Um, in addition to those benefits, because what we're doing is replicating a natural product that has been consumed for thousands of years, we can make a pretty good argument that the product is safe, right? There's that, when you think about it, there's actually way more historical consumption of natural botanical psilocybin than there is of synthetic psilocybin, right? You know, millions of people consume uh, magic mushrooms every day. And when they consume magic mushrooms, they get not just psilocybin, they get psilocin and all the other secondary metabolites as they're called. So when you isolate it, you, you can't draw on that same body of historical evidence. Um, but the presence so of, of all then, these other- uh, Just asking, asking uh, for your argument to, to get it a little bit going. I'm, I also have a question for Josh related to that. But uh, of course, then you're building on um, more historical argument or your evidence comes from case studies or from historical, let's say, extrapolations because um, the pharma story, of course, is very different. As we know, uh, you, you have 100 people or 1,000 or 10,000 people and you try to measure. And the evidence you've been citing right now is more, yeah, an, an, a narrative evidence. Uh, so that's part of the problem probably that you have to face when developing uh, the substance. Uh, well, in, in, in our view, it's actually an advantage because you can uh -huh. use all of that evidence in place of a traditional preclinical toxicology program, right? So in traditional pharma development, especially when you're working with a new substance or a new molecular entity, you have to, you have to do a lot of work to prove that it's safe to give to humans for the first time. But when you use a botanical substance, you can essentially say, you know, millions of people have consumed this substance with no deleterious effect, and therefore it's responsible of us to get into the clinic and actually assess the efficacy. So, so all of that, all of that sort of uh, traditional use, it, it's not a good argument for the efficacy. It's a good argument for the safety. Really, it's our yeah. it's justification yeah. to get into the clinic. Once you get into the clinic, the burden of efficacy is the same whether it's a botanical or a, or a synthetic or whatever. You still have to demonstrate the same um, uh, the same efficacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Josh, how does it sound for a person who likely has grown up in a completely different environment, pharma studies and one molecule being uh, going through phase one to four? Yeah, so. Right, right. well, I, yeah. I, uh, it's a really great question. I mean, I think uh, what Ben was saying is is the part that I'm excited about and that it's it's consistent. So it's, it is a, uh, uh, not a buffet exactly, a, a mixture. Uh, I think there's a technical term, but it's a lot of different things in there, but it's always the same. It's very, very similar every time. So it's, we're studying a consistent product. So that's exciting yeah. to me. That's, that, yeah. that, uh, that, that takes away a lot of my concerns, right? Because you're studying, you know, if you look at the studies with say ayahuasca with the tea, yeah. you know, and, they, and they actually test the teas, they're very variable. I mean, people make them differently and even the same you know, the same place will have very different, that makes it very difficult to study because, you know, you, there's so much variability in that. So, so we don't have that issue here. It's very consistent. Now, the fact that it has those other products in there, um, I guess on the one hand, you could say, well, the pharmacology might be more complicated, but even with the, even with just the one molecule, the pharmacology is pretty complicated and it's not a, 
it's not a clean drug. It's not like a targeted for just one receptor kind yeah, of action, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. We talk about the 5-HT2A receptor, and that probably is driving a lot of it, but there's you know many other effects. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't find that as troubling. And, and this part that Ben's saying about being able to leverage all this data of people who have used this, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's exciting, it's efficient. Uh, so I, I, I'm excited about seeing, I suspect it will be, well, it, the, the product that we're going for has, has a lot of psilocybin in it. It has the, just as much psilocybin as a synthetic psilocybin. So I, it, I, I'm pretty confident it's gonna be doing at least what that is. It might do something extra. Um, people might like it slightly better. Those are open questions. But, um, you know, at, at the very least, it's going to, you know, uh, give people are going to have a trip. It's going to be a, you know, an intense experience. Yeah. Josh, are there other examples in psychiatry that Great question. use candidates that could be called botanical drugs? There's, there's only ever been two botanical, other botanical drugs approved by FDA. Um, several hundred have attempted a development program, uh, but most fail. Uh, and this yeah. is due for a variety of different e reasons, but primarily it's, it's difficult for them to prove uh, sufficient efficacy. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the institution. Let's talk about Health Canada, the FDA, the EMA. What do they think? about botanical drug candidates versus the classical pathway. But what, it, why don't I jump in first? Ben can talk about this for hours. I just have a little bit to say, but I think, let me just jump in. Uh, <laughs> as, as you know, like uh, we, we, are, we are doing a study at UCSF, um, you know, in collaboration with Filament, but you know, yeah. I have the ID. So, so we got approval from the FDA to do a study with this drug, um, with a botanical drug. And my experience has been that their game, that, that might be because of all the work behind the scenes that Filament has done to, to convince them uh, about how that their product is, you know, uh, consistent and safe and, you know, shelf stable. I don't know all that stuff, as Ben will talk about that. But um, my experience has been the FDA is very open to this and just treats it as another drug. And they're like, okay, here's another product and let's see if it works. I mean, Joshua, that's an interesting story for many because the classical psychedelics all have like uh, natural or botanical candidates in the background. Yeah. So, uh, wh were there typical questions that uh, the FDA people or that your colleagues have been asking concern or related to this special drug? The FDA didn't ask me any special, special things. Ben, they may yeah. have asked Ben. So, Ben can yeah. speak to that in a second. Um, my colleagues, well, they ask me all sorts of stuff, but uh, <laughs> some of the questions are like what you're saying, like, oh, how will you know if anything works? Because it's all mixed in there. And, you know, um, and I, I say what I just said, which is we know it's always the same. Uh, and we know that it has a certain amount of psilocybin. Uh, and so we're going to study this new product that has these other things, too. And maybe some of those things have some effects, but most of it is going to be the psilocybin. And, yeah. and, you know, millions and millions of people have used mushrooms. It's just, they haven't been able to study it because it's too variable. So this is yeah. like a consistent mushroom, basically, yeah. Yeah. which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm yeah. excited about it. So Ben, yeah. what's the different pathway of a botanical drug candidate to approval? That's what you're heading for. Yeah. So um, it, it differs by uh, jurisdiction. Um, uh, we can talk about the FDA first. Uh, the FDA has a very clear, uh, what they call botanical drug guidance. Um, they list out all the requirements for botanical drugs, all the definitions. Um, the rumor is, is that FDA um, actually wants more botanical drugs because they recognize that there are lots of traditional remedies all around the world that may have very good efficacy, um, but they, you know, they, they need to go through a, um, a sort of a pharmaceutical development process to prove that efficacy in clinical trials. And so the botanical drug guidance was actually drafted in order to encourage people to apply with botanical drugs. This is all a rumor. Um, but because the pharmaceutical industry is so synthetically focused, 
and that they really only can think about you know new molecular entities and getting a synthetic isolated compound through phase one phase two phase three that you know, no one's been able to take advantage of it because it it it, it speaks in a, the botanical drug guidance is written in the language of herbal products and not in synthetic pharmacology um you know things like test for pesticides and you know residual solvents and uh sourcing materials from different hemispheres like when you're a synthetic chemist like you're like what northern and southern hemisphere like all labs are the same and all chemicals are the same so what on earth is this um so I, like josh I, I think i would i would agree that so far the fda does seem to be very receptive um of our uh, botanical uh, pathway. Um, although during the application process for th the first trial, we, we did get a, a number of questions, primarily related to the analysis, to impurities testing, kind of it's sort of questions, um, uh, that normal questions that, that you would expect. Um, not much related to the justification for the safety of, 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 of uh, putting these products into humans for the first time. When it comes to Health Canada, it's a little different. Health Canada does not have a botanical drug guidance. Um, um, but, you know, nonetheless, we are able to apply with our uh, drugs and get them into uh, phase two uh, human clinical trials. And they focused a lot on um, uh, the stability, the standardization, the, the degradation over time, uh, proving that there wasn't any. Um, um, and, and again, we're, we're, it seemed to be quite receptive. Um, in the EU, where we're actually intending to apply for uh, some trials in the near term, there again, there is a very well-developed uh, herbal medicinal product. In our case, it's called a standardized, uh, refined herbal medicinal product. Um, and so we're, we're, we're very confident our, our product uh, meets the definitions um, uh, of what is required in the EU. And so we should have some uh, trials up and running uh, in the EU and potentially the UK in, uh, in, in the near term. So I, I would say all in all, health, health authorities are, are, are quite receptive. So let's put the two uh, close to each other. So uh, the uh, usual steps in a for a synthetic drug to go through. Is there anything additional that you have to do? Um, yeah, you would have to demonstrate uh, if you are uh, sourcing the raw materials from um, external third parties. Um, you know, like uh, if you're making something out of green tea, um, you, you have to demonstrate that you have a good sourcing plan that, like I said, you can have sources from multiple hemispheres that can account for different crop to crop variations, things like that. In our case, for the magic mushrooms, we actually grow them here in this facility. So that's, that's one of the reasons why mushrooms are actually an ideal candidate to make drugs out of because the actual raw material can be grown indoors in the lab in your GMP quality controlled uh, um, environment. Um, so that would definitely be, be something extra. Um, but I would say something that's less is um, there's actually less um, impurities testing required. And people are often um, uh, surprised uh, when we say that because the difference when you think about a um, a synthetic product that's say 98 or 99 percent pure you have one or two percent of impurities and those could be completely foreign toxic and often are uh toxic chemicals right that have very strictly controlled limits and so the you know the 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 fda is going to want to say like how much dimethyl fluor fluorine is there how much um is there toluene in there and all these different things because they're not natural substances in, in our case, um, the remainder things are all things that come from the magic mushroom and are all things that we already know are safe. So the impurities in our case are really only residues that are left over from the manufacturing process and are in minute quantities. Um, even though, you know, people are surprised to hear, well, you're, you mean the psilocybin content in your products, not 99%? No, it's actually significantly less than that. But the remaining 20, 30, 40 percent that's not psilocybin, it's not impurities. It's actually part of the botanical drug. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's yeah. A, it's the whole complement of this mixture that's considered to be the drug, not just the active portion. Yeah. So it's like um, uh, alcohol. Like, like you 
you can get, you know, pure ethanol, but no one drinks that. You know, it's gross. You know? <laughs> like, well, like you know. said, Josh, you can get synthetic caffeine in the drugstore, but no one drinks, no one, uh, people still drink coffee. Um, authorities like to have a drug on the market that is pure, that they know how, how much of the effective ingredients are in, that is stable. Yeah, so, and that's, generally also part of the G, so-called GMP uh, production process that, that is supposed to guarantee that. So I could, I don't know who of you wants to explain it, but uh, so is there something different that you have to go through uh, with a botanical drug candidate when it comes to GMP? Maybe somebody, Josh, could you briefly explain to our audience what GMP I think does? I think this one's better for Ben. He's the manufacturer. Yeah. I, yeah. you know. I just I just get it in a bottle, you know. And you, yeah, I mean, you I'm, just drink it. I understood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like I, you know, I'm not a manufacturer, so I think this is, yeah. this is in Ben's wheelhouse. So, so GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices, um, and it's essentially a, a set of uh, guidelines um, all about how you manufacture uh, something responsibly. It could be a, a, a drug candidate, or a food product, or a dietary supplement, or or um, or whatever. Um, and part of making a, I, I guess you would say a GMP quality uh, a product is, like you said, Henrik, uh, demonstrating that the product is uh, shelf stable. And that has been historically a challenge for natural psychedelic products like psilocybin and some of the related uh, alkaloids. Uh, even in mushrooms, uh, after they're harvested, um, uh, people report, and we've seen with our um, we've seen with our own analysis that the psilocybin can degrade over time in the magic mushroom. Uh, so it's very important to show that the final drug product and the intermediary drug substance uh, both contain your, uh, all of the different active metabolites and that they are stable over time. Um, and I, I guess that would be a, a fair thing where that we have to show in addition to a synthetic product, we actually have to show the stability of all of the metabolites in our product. So mm -hmm. our stability program is measuring, you know, a dozen different uh, peaks um, rather than just one, uh, one, one single peak. Um, and, and luckily at this point, we have, I think, uh, just over a year of stability data on our, on our drug products. So that's, that's a challenge we've been able to overcome. And, and again, certainly one that uh, the health authorities look at when, when you apply for your clinical trials. Yeah, and Ben, is it, is it chemically possible to identify all additional products to the main uh, um, ingredient. some of them are unknown uh, right so yeah. some of them have uh some of them haven't been named uh some of them are unknown but nonetheless uh we quantify them um and then we we show that they're stable over time yeah yeah so uh one word to the audience uh two of you have already begun to uh to ask questions and uh, the first one, uh, Josh already answered it, but it's like the like the royal question that we have been expecting tonight. I think uh, so. Uh, I think it was. Uh, let me see. It was Barry asking if the trial or trials that are coming in the future are up to comparing synthetic versus. Botanic, the botanical uh, version of psilocybin. Is that something in the near future coming up? So, so what I, I, I put in the answer, but this first study that we're doing is not compared, there's no synthetic psilocybin arm. Um, you know, we're, we're doing uh, botanical psilocybin and botanical psilocin um, in healthy individuals uh, with the goal of trying to understand the time course and subjective effects. Um, so it's not, it's not a clinical, it's not an efficacy trial. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. important for us to have a better idea of how there's, there's how people respond yeah. to this. Josh, is, is the question of importance to you as a psychiatrist having these two candidates run against each other? Absolutely, I think that would be a really interesting question. Uh, yeah, especially um, you know we haven't talked about psilocin, but you know you know it's possible that these drugs will be more consistent or will have a, a better side effect profile. Uh, so you know there are a lot of questions that could be answered. Um, comparing them head to head. You yeah. just had to start somewhere. <laughs> so Ben, are the authorities asking you these questions? Are they demanding of you that you have them run against each other? 
Um, well, given that synthetic psilocybin is also uh, still an unapproved uh, investigational drug, they're, they're not, right? If, uh, if psilocybin were to become an approved drug and we were, say, to use uh, synthetic psilocybin as what's called like a, a reference listed product, then yeah. Or if, if we were trying to come up with to show bioequivalency or something like that, yeah, then we would have to do a, a comparative study uh, head to head. Um, it's, it's also a question we get a lot, like are you going to put um, your botanical psilocybin head to head versus a synthetic psilocybin? And you know, m maybe one day we, we will do, uh, but for now, you know, given that we um, have a limited number of resources, right, if we have money and time to put onto a clinical trial, we're going to use it to, you know, promote our own products rather than to try to prove uh, uh, against synthetic. Yeah, yeah. So would you expect, because that is, a, that is a question that is often raised, so would you expect that there is a party who would be, uh, that would be interested in uh, building such a study? Oh, I mean, we get that. Yeah, there are lots of parties that are interested in, 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 in such a study. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so whether it's us, I, I mean, we believe we're the first ones to actually ever come with a botanical psychedelic drug candidate, right? So for, for now, any such study would have to use one of our candidates uh, against synthetic. The other, the other danger, frankly, is, is that unless the differences are huge, um, um, and, and probably they're not going to be huge, um, the differences don't have to be huge in order for you to have a much better product. Anyways, um, but the point is you might need a very big, large power clinical trial in order to conclusively prove any differences, right? So it might, so at, likely in a small trial, all you'll prove is that they are st statistically indistinguishable. Right. So um, so it, it's going to take a lot of uh, it's going to take a, a big clinical trial and be quite expensive to conclusively prove anything uh, different one way or the other. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, understandable. So uh, you talked about purity. Is purity the main factor uh, for a botanical drug candidate? Are there other categories that you're competing for, that you're heading for or that the authorities demand of you? Um, the, the, I, I don't, I don't quite understand, like in, in terms of, in terms of purity. So is purity the most critical ca category for uh, a botanical drug development or are there others? I, I think it's, uh, um, probably stability and repeatability and consistency. Um, um, the actual like purity, like how potent is your drug substance? Um, I think that is of lesser importance than demonstrating that you've managed to deliver it consistently, a very similar dose, almost identical dose every single time. Yeah. And that's yeah. true about synthetics as well. I mean, obviously they want it to be fairly pure, but the consistency is the real thing that matters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I am inclined to almost change to the to the intellectual property topic, but we have another uh, question that was asked by, from the audience that uh, Josh has already commented. So, do you think that these uh, botanical drug candidate studies will emerge in a university, or will they will they remain to be? Uh, a private company uh, thing, maybe Josh or yeah. I, I guess I, I'm a little confused by the because I'm at a university, so so I, I, I we're already doing it at a university, um, and then you know synthetic psilocybin. You know the university. I guess there were some like years ago there were university people who made their own psilocybin, but that hasn't been true for a long time now, and so everyone is getting their psilocybin from various companies of various sorts. USONA, Compass, um, other other players in the space. Um, so, so I guess there haven't been any studies with botanical psilocybin yet. We're doing one, but I suspect, I, I, I think actually, Ben, there's some other people, other university researchers interested in your products, right? Yeah, in fact, uh... I would say at, at the moment, the majority of natural psychedelic research is taking place at universities. Yeah, yeah. So um, intellectual property, IP, 
uh, patents. That's a big topic in, in the pharma drug development business. How would a company that's developing a botanical drug candidate uh, strategize this, this topic? So what do you want to do? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very good question. It's it's one that we we get a lot, um, and so it it bears repeating that um, because it in in this case and in all botanical drugs, um, your um, um, active ingredients are uh, compounds that are found in nature, and therefore the compounds themselves uh, are not patentable. Um, and that obviously that's the case with with psilocybin. It's not pass, po, po, it's not possible to patent psilocybin, whether you make it synthetically or naturally, for that matter, right? So given that we cannot adopt the you know traditional pharmaceutical approach of make a new molecule and get a patent on the molecule, what do we do? Well, um, in our case, um, uh, we were the, the first, uh, we believe, to develop a stabilized and standardized uh, formulation of, uh, of these extracts. And we actually had to develop new technology um, that had never been um, used before um, in order to, to do so. And so our IP rests around the uh, manufacturing technologies that we have developed uh, and implemented for the first time in order to achieve the necessary quality for, um, for the drug candidates to be entered into clinical trials. So that is a, a slightly different approach, right? Um, um, using protecting around the, the, the manufacturing patents um, uh, rather than the actual compound itself. Um, it's, I think, uh, a, a, kind of like a less aggressive um, um, a, approach, um, but I think also nonetheless one that um, uh, protects us uh, quite well from uh, direct competitors. I mean, there, there's, we're not the only ones to come up with the idea of making natural psychedelic drugs, uh, yeah. but so far, I think you see that we're the only company with, uh, that's achieved a, a stable enough product a consistent enough product to get into a clinical trial. And that's because of the unique technology that, that we've been able to, uh, to develop and, and, and apply for a patent protection on. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to studies, are you actually heading for data exclusivity or is there another uh, path forward there for IP or are you not looking at that at all? Um, well, the, we would, um, we would certainly, uh, um, judge our products to be, uh, new chemical entities because, um, um, an exact product, uh, of that nature would never have been approved, uh, before. And therefore I, we would, in our belief, be entitled to, uh, data package exclus exclusivity, um, um, whether or not at, at that, this, this would be when any drugs get approved, uh, whether or not we would, you know, decide to, to license out that data package. Um, I'm not sure we're, we're thinking very, very far into the future after the conclusion of many additional clinical trials. So I'm not sure what we would do at that point. Yeah. So um, did, the, did the question of uh, indigenous rights and the whole debate, the discourse around that, are these questions that you're debating in the company? Uh, is it debated by the authorities? It's a debate that Josh and I were having, what, two, two days ago, right? Um, obviously, we, uh, we, we recognize that many of these substances have a long and rich use by indigenous communities um, all around the world. And um, we're certainly not uh, trying to, you know, replace or supplant uh, uh, anything related to, to that use. Really, at the end of the day, what we are trying to achieve is a um, stable, standardized formulation, right? Because if these, as Josh mentioned, if you look at, for instance, the ayahuasca literature, even in controlled ayahuasca clinical trials, they measure the dose of the DMT and it can measure by as much as a factor of 10 within the same trial, right? In order for these products to have any kind of broad adoption, for them to be studied clinically, for us to have any kind of demonstrable evidence, some kind of standardization is gonna be necessary, not just for, for those purposes, but also for patient safety and experience and, and, and good outcomes. So really at the end of the day, what we're doing is providing just a little bit of extra 
I guess, standardization technology to uh, traditional products so that they can be adopted by the most number of people in the future in the safest way possible. Yeah. So you have uh, uh, a question from the audience that's closely related to, to the topic. Of course, uh, people are thinking about uh, the, the special case of Oregon. So in Oregon, mm -hmm. there is going to be a, a regulation or a law up that allows a certain kind of people to use uh, psilocybin mushrooms, the actual mushrooms in something that could be called ceremonies. So it's still unclear if it's therapy, if it's treatment, uh, that's these are difficult questions. So uh, the question from the audience is, is, uh, is that impacting your, your perspective? Is, uh, how does it impact your perspective that uh, things like that happen in Oregon and maybe in other states? The, the specifically the provision for um, uh, uh, indigenous use of the substances within Oregon or just the Oregon market in, in general? I don't know what, uh, what our audience member wanted to know. It, 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 he just or wanted to ask, was, was, was just asking, how does what's happening in Oregon impact uh, your company's plans? Yeah. So um, Oregon State is obviously a, a leader in, uh, in progressive policy towards uh, psilocybin use and legalization. It will be the, the first um, uh, legal North American market. Um, beginning in January, you'll be able to apply for a license to manufacture and, um, and provide psilocybin to um, uh, clients, right, as they're, as they're called. Um, uh, and it's given by facilitators, right? Notice that the language is very specifically not patients and therapists um, and, and things like that. Um, the rules in Oregon haven't been finalized yet, right? We're in the middle of the public comment period, um, but the draft rules um, provide for three categories of products. One is um, uh, mushrooms, whole, whole mushrooms uh, or ground mushrooms. Uh, two is edible products. Um, and three is natural extracts. Um, the species is limited to Psilocybe cubensis. The, the growing medium uh, excludes wood chips and manure. It's actually very um, uh, uh, prescriptive in what you can do and, and also in, in what you cannot do. Um, we think that um, uh, people obviously should have a choice in um, whether they consume a magic mushroom or a ground up mushroom or, or a natural extract. Of course, the, the, ch the choice always uh, lies with the, with the consumer or their uh, practitioner or, 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 or guide or, or therapist. Um, but we, we do think that a naturally extracted product has a certain number of advantages over a, a whole mushroom, primarily when it comes to standardization, right? Um, uh, for instance, one of our products is a 25 milligram uh, standardized capsule. Um, it's a small little size three capsule. It contains 25 milligrams of, uh, of psilocybin precisely. Um, and, you know, you can imagine that you could take this small little capsule or you would take roughly, say, five grams of, uh, of mushrooms. Um, but even with um, analysis of various mushrooms, it might be hard to know exactly uh, how much psilocybin you're going to get because it's not possible you're not going to it's not feasible to sit and and measure the um psilocybin content in uh, every single mushroom and, and that's fine for a recreational purpose right it's uh it's uh it's totally fine to have some some variability in there um uh, but we do think that uh for any kind of therapeutic application um it will be very very important to have a high degree of standardization yeah. So, Josh, uh, let's jump back from the Oregon case or maybe recreational case to clinical trials. Again, can you tell the audience a little bit about the kind of trial you are uh, doing together with Filament? And does sure. it have, uh, well, what's, what's the goal of these trials? Yeah. Well, before I want to get to that, I just, one of the questions was about uh, is there a path for, uh, for psilocybin to be removed from Schedule 1? And I would say definitely. Um, that's uh, all these companies that are doing phase three trials. Uh, are, that's their goal. And um, I think the yeah. FDA seems to be open to it, but who knows how long that will take. Yeah. 
Josh, can you take care of the microphone? Maybe bring it a little bit closer to your mouth. Oh. You're How yeah? about now. Is that okay? Yeah. Hello? Still yeah, better. Yeah. Better? Thank you. I, I, my internet may have just been cutting out. Um, yeah, I was just saying that the you know, all these companies that are doing uh, phase three trials, uh, Compass, uh, USONA, you know, they're hoping that the FDA will allow them to reschedule psilocybin and you know maps with MDMA. So yes, it's definitely possible. Uh, but getting back to the other question, so about the trial that we're doing. So um, we are doing a trial in, in healthy individuals. So these are individuals without uh, you know, significant mental illness. Uh, and we're giving them oral psilocybin, oral psilocin, and sublingual psilocin. Uh, and the idea is to try and understand the time course, uh, the consistency, and any side effects. Because these, you know, these particular compounds have not been given. We, we're confident they're safe, but exactly how they're going to perform when someone takes them, um, you know, it's not, we, we don't know. So, so that's the first study. Um, and, you know, we're trying to also get the, the dosage of the psilocin and the, and the oral and the sublingual psilocin correct. So that's-, yeah, that's And, and that's are you saying. orally, orally administering uh, everything? Yeah. Uh, so except, yes, except for the sublingual. I mean, that's still orally, but it's yeah. you know, below the tongue. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how many subjects uh, do you have in the, in the study? The plan is for 20 subjects and it's within subject design. So people will, will take all of the different compounds separated by a month at a time. Interesting, interesting, yeah. So just bridging to one of the questions of the audience. So um, these studies being done in uh, 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 FDA uh, approval. So could that have been done uh, uh, under Health Canada or EMA approval too, Ben? Uh, yes, they could have been for sure. Yeah. But then we wouldn't have got to work with Josh. Yeah, that's uh, I'd have course. to move up there. I mean, Canada's pretty yeah, nice. Josh would have to move to Canada. Yeah. So, what's what's uh, what's the reason you did it in uh, uh, in uh, the United States? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, one is uh, probably the most important is that Josh and his team um, already had a lot of experience running um, uh, psychedelic clinical trials, and we thought that. Uh, Josh and the team at UCSF would be uh, one of the best groups in the whole world uh, to, to run the run the trial. Um, um, I think broadly speaking, there has been that it's changing very rapidly, you know, th because uh, consider it was a year ago that we were um, or maybe even 18 months ago that we were evaluating sites for for clinical trials. And a lot more had happened in terms of psychedelic research in the United States than, uh, than in Canada. Um, now, I think uh, Health, Health Canada, I think, has approved six uh, psilocybin clinical trials since the beginning of this year alone, right? So I think Canada is going to jump out into the forefront very, very quickly. Um, but I think that even 18 months ago, that, that wasn't the case. So it was uh, tougher to find um, uh, clinical sites that could do it responsibly, um, and with experience and have a, a institutional review board that uh, had experience with psychedelics. That's a, a, another big question as well. Uh, so um, all, all those reasons. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. You're going to make me blush. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just jump in yeah. on that as well. Just saying, you know, these, you know, psychedelics are super hot as well while we're all here. And, you know, there's growing interest across the whole world, right? Of Canada and the US sure. and their new groups. And, um, and let's yet, not forget Europe, Josh. Let's not forget Europe. Yeah, Europe. Yeah, Europe. Sorry. You know, I'm in Europe right now. Yeah, Europe, very hot all over. Um, and yet these studies are not easy to do. They, they, they're both typically, they're typically both a, you know, pharmacological intervention that has a a lot of effects. Some people would call them side effects. Some people would call them effects, um, as well as a psychotherapy intervention, which you know is hardly anyone does that, right? Like we don't do SSRI plus psychotherapy trials typically. Um, so you know th those are two skill sets that are very hard to bring together, uh, and also they're very time intensive in, in the sense that you know typically with a depression trial you're talking about 20 hours of therapy. So that's a very large psychotherapy intervention. Um, and don't forget all the controlled substances difficulty as well. Yeah, controlled substances. Layered on top of all that. 
yeah, you need to be able to, you know, in the US, you need to be able to have a Schedule One license. The DEA has to come and check out your space and make sure you're not diverting it. And, you know, there's all sorts of challenges to doing it. Um, and you also need dedicated space. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, without getting too much into it, but like academics, like it's always fighting for space. And the kind of space you need for a psychedelic study is you need a room that is decorated sure. in a particular way. That's actually very difficult to get in the academic setting because people want to use the rooms all other times. So, so you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of challenges to getting up and running and doing these things, not to mention the regulatory approvals. There's just a lot of things and, um, and, and the expertise, right? You need, you need lots yeah. of different expertises to, sure. to effectively run these trials. Just a, a trial or a clinical trial design study probably uh, often debated, but uh, the classical uh, approach of these authorities that we talked about, FDA, EMA, is to study a drug. Mm -hmm. But with psychedelic uh, treatments, most people would agree that we do not study a drug only, that it's a mix of, um, of a setting. Uh, the term setting sometimes obscures um, that a lot of people are doing psychotherapy. So it's a mix of psychotherapy and, and the drug. And are the authorities really up to that situation or are they still pushing you into studying a drug and doing some something that is like uh, called psychological support? Yeah, I, I can't speak to all the authorities. Uh, you know, so far they haven't really gotten into, told us what to do in, with the psychotherapy. I think it's a really great point, though, in that you know the FDA doesn't regulate psychotherapy, right? There's no, you know, the FDA doesn't kick down the door and be like, "You're making extra interpretations," you know, like no one, no one does that, right? There's, um, you know, it's, it's all the the licensing boards that regulate it, but they don't regulate it closely. They just kind of look for you know violations, you know, boundary violations and things like that, and just make sure the person is well trained in general. Um, so exactly how the FDA say is going to you know, approve a drug that has to be given with psychotherapy, I, I feel is like a really big question. Um, and, you know, and I'm not an expert in, you know, politics or Oregon, but, you know, I think this is one of the things they're really grappling with. Like, they're, you know, how is this going to work? Like, who are the people who can deliver it? Is there any oversight over what they, people, those people do? Um, you know, what is considered ethical and not ethical? And what is, you know, and these are all really hard questions. Um, and then you, that's what I was saying earlier about implementation. Like if you roll this out, how are you going to make sure that people are doing it the right way? Even if you could figure out what the right way was, you know, that we don't really have a mechanism for that. You know, like, like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy is our sort of most widely used psychotherapy approach in the world. You know, many books and lectures and, you know, but no one is going in unless you're in a research study or some you know, medical system and, and it's enforcing people to do it just like the manual says, right? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And, and we probably so actually, shouldn't do that, right? So yeah, it's actually um, an interesting time also for the authorities that are regulating these drugs. So at least here in Europe or here in Germany, we have regular uh, discussions with people who have been regulating drugs and are now confronted with some combined treatment so right. they might have to they will but they certainly will have to adapt to these new challenges yeah. um the audience is certainly interested in the kind of indications you are heading for you're heading towards so what's up what's coming up ben <laughs> it's a it's a fascinating question and and it's one that we um we talk about a lot uh, with Josh and in, in, in internally. Um, for now, because um, we're coming with the first uh, natural psychedelic uh, drug candidates, for now our strategy is uh, simply kind of to follow on uh, the quote unquote biggest indications uh, of depression, major depressive disorder and treatment resistant depression, um, and, uh, and and kind of uh, follow, follow along the the synthetic candidates uh, progress in, in that regard, but we're always looking at um, at new avenues, new indications, um, um, and I think Josh actually has a has, has a lot of insights on where um, a psychedelics could could potentially go in terms of new or lesser thought of indications. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, to the audience, we have uh, less than half an hour left. So this is already going for one hour. <laughs> and uh, please ask your questions. So I'm just picking the question of Patrick here. And Patrick asks, what is your uh, view of the European research landscape when it comes to psilocybin compared to the US and Canada? What are your views on European developments and trials? Do you have any? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Josh? What, what do you have an opinion? Uh, uh, well, uh, do is the UK still part of Europe? I don't know. Is that no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 it's not, right? no, 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 it's uh, close to Europe. It's called it's close, close to Europe. It's close, right? Yeah. No, I heard about that. that I guess it would have been an easier question before Brexit if you could lump the UK into yeah. EU. Yeah. Oh, but, but guys, we wanted to avoid the Ukraine war and uh, the Brexit <laughs> questions, but let's get back to. I, I just bring it up because. You know, Imperial and uh, you know David Nutt and Robin Card Harris. You know they they were doing they continue to do and uh, did a lot of really important work. Um, Robin's now at UCSF with us, so you know, but he you know so so that's nice for us. But but you know, um, King's King's College as well is doing a lot of important work with Compass. Uh, James uh, Rucker, I believe. Um, so so that has been a major place of strength. Um, but that's not in Europe. Uh, outside of Europe, uh, Switzerland. Switzerland's in Europe, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. That. Yeah. Not. I can't remember. It's not in the EU, maybe, or is it in the EU? I, sorry. No. 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 Right. It is not. Okay. Okay. I'm not totally off. Um, Franz Wollenbeier and his group, Katrina Preller, and the, you know, Franz basically kept the light alive for decades of psychedelic research. You know, for, I don't know, 40, 40 years doing research, even when it was dark everywhere else. So, I, you know, I think that's another place of major strength. And what I understand is, you know, the Netherlands now, they've been, you know, giving um, the truffles, the psychedelic truffles. And so there's a, actually for money, sort of clinical progress there. And then there are groups popping up around. Um, uh, Ramaker uh, in, in the Netherlands, I believe, is also you know, doing amazing work. And then there are some people in, in Ireland now, and um, Germany, obviously, and Sweden is, is, has um, a bunch of people who are doing really good work. And there are probably other people I don't even know about. Uh, so it's, it's kind of blossoming all over. I'm not as familiar with the regulatory landscape in Europe because I, I haven't had to navigate it. Um, so I, I can't speak to that. Uh, but lots of great work is, has been done and is continuing to be done. Yeah, yeah. I think drug development in general is focused uh, in the United States uh, because it's the biggest market, right? Because they pay the most for drugs and it's very expensive to develop a drug. So you might as well go after the biggest and most highly paying market first. Uh, and, and I think that's true of a, of a, of a lot of drugs. Well. Um, uh, but what, what, I, what I will say over the last little while, there has been quite some interest uh, in our uh, candidates uh, for academic researchers to use uh, in the EU. Um, I think that uh, having a supply of uh, psychedelic drugs has been a limiting factor um, uh, for uh, academic researchers. Um, and, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we, we, uh, we actually give um, these kinds of academic researchers our uh, drug substances for free so that they can uh, get their research uh, up off the ground um, um, uh, much quicker. As I mentioned, we there there are a couple of academic trials that are hopefully going to get started very soon um, uh, in Europe. So uh, hopefully we'll have more uh, European news to share uh, uh, very soon. Yeah. So so Ben and uh, Charles, we usually have a couple of academic researchers in the audience. So if you give your uh, product to academic research groups for free, uh, what does what uh, obligations come with that? Is it safety data? Is it more than safety data? It's it's safety data. Um, there there's kind of two 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 parts of that. Um, one part is, well, uh, if, if anyone uses our drug, they're required to report uh, certain things like um, adverse events uh, uh, in the trial, um, uh, because if, if, say, something goes wrong, we need to know about it because that drug is being used in other clinical trials, so we need to notify all the other trials immediately. Um, but also, when it comes to, um, uh, when you do a drug submission, 
uh, for approval, you have to show the authority that there was um, a certain number of doses given, and the number of doses ranges depending on what kind of intervention it is. It could be 1,000, could be 1,500. So if you have an academic trial that has given, say, 50 doses, that can, and, it was, and it was shown to be safe, uh, that can actually help uh, for your own um, uh, uh, drug candidate submission. So yeah, we do ask for the for the for the for this for the researchers to share the the safety data. Most of these studies are going to be published in the academic literature, anyways, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Ben Barry is asking another question, uh, uh, jumping a little bit back to uh, the IP question. Maybe can your manufacturing process uh, be used for other botanical formulations like ayahuasca? Uh, I don't know if Barry means the manufacturing process or the extraction process. I don't know. Yeah. Um, broadly speaking, uh, yes. Um, although I, I would say that every um, uh, uh, psychedelic uh, plant or, 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 or fungal species is different and the target compounds are slightly different, um, but we can modify in general, modify the, um, the procedure um, in order to um, extract and standardize different kinds of uh, different kinds of compounds, other other tryptamine alkaloids, or you know, say ibogaine or or something like that. So in general, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's an uh, Sean is asking uh, if in uh, in the strategy of your company and other companies, there's also an outlook on the recreational market. So that's also a question we get a lot. And um, I, I think it's a fascinating question because um, for now, the psychedelics industry is very much pharmaceutically focused, right? Everyone says, oh, no, 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 we're, we're a pharmaceutical company. You know, we don't believe in recreational or, you know, that's a different market and that, that's something else entirely. Um, but it's it kind of ignores the fact that you know, millions of people take magic mushrooms on a recreational basis all the time um, uh, and they do so safely and they enjoy it and they come back uh, and, and do it again with their friends. Um, and here in Vancouver, um, in this liberal bastion, you, you can actually go to a store of several stores and buy magic mushrooms openly with 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 money right uh you don't have to like go upstairs to like a weird back room it's like an open storefront advertising magic mushrooms for sale and this is openly tolerated by the government and the police and everybody because they recognize that it's probably not doing anybody any harm right or at least not as much harm as a lot of the other toxic drugs that we have uh on the on the illegal market um, so I, I guess all of which is to say, for, for now, we too are also uh, uh, focused on the pharmaceutical development of botanical drugs. Um, but I think what separates us from a uh, synthetically focused um, uh, uh, drug development company is that eventually, if there is a recreational market, I, we think obviously people are going to want standardized extracts as part of that recreational market. Just look at the legal cannabis market that we have here in Canada, right? You can buy not just uh, buds and flowers for you to smoke, but you can also buy gummies and, uh, and vapes and tinctures and all these other things, which are all standardized extracts of, 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 of various cannabinoids. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I like to call the, um, the two dirty R words of the psychedelics industry that nobody wants to talk about. One of them is revenue, right? When are we actually going to make money selling these things? And the number two, number two is recreational. People don't want to talk uh, about a recreational market, but I think we should. And I think we should, um, I, I think we should, um, you know, uh, probably advocate for one, obviously done, you know, responsibly and with the appropriate regulation. Josh, as a psychiatrist and as a researcher, uh, what do you think about that border between therapeutic and recreational use? Is it blurry? Is it a hard border? Have views? Have your views changed on that? It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, well, I'll say a couple of things. One is, uh, in the U.S., you know, we've had this war on drugs, and I, I firmly believe that it's been a racist failure. Right. So, so. I don't think that that is great. So that has not worked. We've tried that and you know, we've arrested people and we've spent lots of money. 
Um, and I don't think that that's the right path. I'm not a politician. I, you know, I don't design laws and stuff, but, um, you know, so there's that. That's not to say that the drugs are not bad for people, uh, you know, that, you know, drugs are not bad. Methamphetamine, uh, you know, I see a lot of people who are using methamphetamine and get into a lot of problems, uh, psychosis, medical problems, you know, terrible stuff. Um, and so it's, I'm not saying that these things are safe, but but the war on drugs, you know, making it a crime and sort of using sort of a police state, you know, has not worked. So with psychedelics, there already is a recreational market. <laughs> you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, millions and millions of people are using uh, psychedelics, using mushrooms, for example. Um, so I believe in the, in the United States, is it, it is like 35, a little bit more than 35 million lifetime use. That's the highest in the world, yeah. As far as we know, USA number one, right? Uh, and there, and there already are movements to decriminalize it. You know, Oakland, for example, near me, it's decriminalized. So they, they, they officially are like, we're not going to arrest anyone for its use. It's not legal, but it's not illegal either. Um, and so, you know, I think I suspect that that's probably that's going to happen more and more. Oregon, California is talking about decriminalizing it at the state level. You know, different states are all pushing these different ideas, you know, the legalization, but, but, you know, a step before legalization would just be, you know, making it not illegal anymore, but not, you can't, you know, open a store, but, you know, you could grow it or, you know, you, different states are probably going to do it differently. Um, that's not to say that these compounds are not without, without risk, you know, there definitely can be risks, um, you know, and I think a lot of the work that I do, I'm trying to figure out who is it risky for? For example, um, all the clinical trials of psilocybin, synthetic psilocybin, uh, have excluded people who, who have a history of uh, any, any hint of bipolarity. So any, if they have bipolar themselves, they've certainly been excluded. And most studies have excluded anyone with a family history of, of bipolar. So a first degree relative, or in some studies, it's a, it's a second degree relative. So, you know, a cousin, which if you think about, that's pretty extreme, you know? Um, and the idea when it's, most people, most of the time it's not even justified, but if you really press, the idea is that maybe people with bipolar are at risk of developing, you know, mania, maybe getting worse on, on psychedelics. And you know, you could imagine that's true based on the you know, pharmacology, serotonin, serotonin action, antidepressants, flipping people into mania. So there, there is a theoretical risk. Uh, but, but we've been doing some work trying to figure out, well, what exactly is the risk and is the, what's the data that would support this? And it turns out it's very, very thin. You know, we, we, we looked at the literature and saw these case reports uh, of psychedelic use, but there, most of them, people were using lots of substances all at once or using psychedelics. Right, so that's one of the problems, isn't it? So when, when you really uh, try to measure the risks, uh, you, yeah. you come to poly drug users. All right, exactly. Them. Right. All of them drink alcohol, all of them, uh, many of them use cannabis, so it's That's very right. hard. Or to... stimulants or, you know, or people, there yeah. were some people who were mentally ill beforehand who were using high dose psychedelics every day for like a month, you know, and then they, they get psychotic. So we, we did find a couple case reports that seemed pretty compelling that it was someone who didn't have bipolar that we knew about, that used a psychedelic and then they developed, but like maybe two or three cases ever reported in the entire literature. So it does seem like it's theoretically possible, but what the actual rate is, it, we don't know. Um, and you know, we did a survey actually, so we did an international survey um, trying to find people with bipolar who have used uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms. And actually, what they told us was that yes, they they do get worsening manic symptoms uh, afterwards, uh, but they also reported that they, they it treats their depression. Um, and we, you know, we've done a qualitative analysis of the interviewing of a subset of people. Uh, and we're, we're basically, we did all this to ramp up to a clinical trial, with, which we're doing, where we're going to dose this. We're actually recruiting, as we speak, of people with bipolar two depression who are currently depressed. And we're going to try and give them psilocybin and see mostly if it's safe, um, but maybe if we can help treat their depression like people do with unipolar depression. But you know, this is a big question, right? Like, like if it's true that people with bipolar shouldn't be using psilocybin, that's really important to know, <laughs> and something that we could give education to the pop populace about. But right now, we can't really give intelligent um, uh, advice, uh, and and uh, you know, that's the kind of work I think is really important. And 
the kind of work that I do is only one way of getting at it, right? Like clinical trials is one way, but you know, epidemiological work is another. Um, you know, post marketing work is another. So, so you know, I think, I guess my, I guess my, what I'm saying is to answer your question, there already is a recreational market. I don't think we can actually stop there being a recreational market. There's a whole political decision that, that, that's being made over and over again in different places. The research that I do, I'm trying to see who is it safe for? Is it effective? You know, what are the risks? How can it be given safely? How can we optimize it? And you know, how can we use it as a treatment? And and these things can exist in parallel, right? Like you know, we can we we maybe we just figure out that yeah, it's safe to use recreationally, but it's not clinically effective. I don't think that's going to happen, but it's certainly possible. Or we find out there are certain people with certain histories that it really is very risky to use these compounds. That would also be very important to know. So, so that's, yeah, that's, that's my opinion on it. Um, I know that that's more, uh, uh, Josh, again, a uh, more question that's we're going into the guess uh, direction, but do you think there are important genetical differences in people from uh, how they react to silos, uh, psilocin or psilocybin? as related to outcomes, positive outcomes? I haven't seen any data that suggests that. I mean, neither, there, neither have I. But, yeah, but, there, there, there are some data when people try to predict who's going to benefit, but I think it's too early to tell. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people want to predict uh, who, who's going to have a challenging experience, but, but challenging experiences don't mean you're not going to get better. So, so yeah. I, you know, I... I mean, yeah, I'll give you another example. We're doing a study the now. The opposite seems to be uh, true in some yeah. of uh, Johns Hopkins right. studies. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, the challenging experience, those people actually benefit. That is, they, and we, we were finding that in our qualitative work. People, I mean, yeah. we heard some stories from people who had really horrifying experiences. Yeah, and yeah. Yet they all, for the most part, say that it was actually a very powerful changing experience. That it, you know, it was something that they thought about a lot that helped them. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. It's pretty complex. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I guess there, is, but there are a couple of things like blood pressure. That's a pretty clear one. The psilocybin, your blood pressure goes up. And so in all the clinical trials, if your blood pressure is over 140 or over 90, you don't get dosed. And we do the same. And it's pretty consistent when you take the medication, people's blood pressure goes up. So that seems like a pretty important thing to warn people about because you know if your blood pressure gets too high, it's really bad, right? So that's not some people, something that people talk about, and it probably is dose related. But yeah. you know that 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 simple thing would be important to, to mention to people. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd like before I'd like to close on a more cultural or outlook uh, perspective. There is one technical question. I think it's for you, Ben. Uh, that uh, has been asked uh, so um, because you've been mentioning consistency yeah so and uh, Marcus is asking what needs consistency exactly referring to a botanical product is it the measurement of the main active compound or psilocybin in that case or is it the content of all other ingredient as consistent so he's oh, oh, if, the, if the answer is, is B uh, is the is you need to show batch to batch reproducibility of not just the active, uh, but also the, the secondary actives, um, as well as the re remaining uh, uh, plant compounds. They need to be reproducible from, from batch to batch and then uh, over time, right? So once we make it um, and we store it, right? Like a, a product that has a shelf life of one month isn't very useful. Um, so you need to show that it can extend for a year or two without, uh, without, uh, without degrading. To both of you, um, natural and spiritual are often associated in people using uh, mushrooms or, uh, or products close, close to mushrooms. So how do you deal with it as an as a, uh, entrepreneur and as a, as a researcher at the university? How you deal with those questions related to spirituality? Do you have a theory about that, an opinion? This is a, it's Josh, a hard question. I mean, it's, you know, the definition of spirituality is, is it's hard to, to really pin down what exactly that means. Um, I think it's is, clear is that, that- Is that the beginning of an answer of an- of a, It's the of beginning a of an answer. Who, who himself <laughs> wouldn't apply the term spiritual to his own life practice? 
I would say, well, let's see. It, it's a pretty complex issue. Uh, certainly there are spiritual and cultural practices that, that as Ben said, I am not studying. You know, I am not studying shamanistic practices, for example. That's not what I, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not a socio sociologist. I am, you know, using some technology, these pharmacology and these compounds and trying to see, trying to develop a way of de delivering this to people in mostly San Francisco who have particular DSM defined diagnoses in a particular consistent way. Now, so, so in a certain way, like that culture, I'm not studying a culture or religious practice, you know, um, at the same time, spiritual or meaning is something that's easier to talk about and meaning making humans are a meaning making species and psychotherapy in general involves a lot of meaning making, right? Like it's not just a random, you know, CBT often people will talk about just learning a particular, you know, cognitive trick. And that is some of it, but a lot of it is their own personal meaning about what this, where they're going in their life and what they want out of life. And, you know, these really big questions. Um, Psychedelic therapy has that a lot. And, and I, I don't think we would want to extract that from there. I, I don't want a meaningless treatment. Um, uh, well, so well, 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 just don't you treatment. have a lot of meaningless treatments in psychiatry if you're, uh, if you're just prescribing SSRIs? I would argue, I mean, certainly that's one way of thinking about it. And maybe <laughs> some providers do that, I guess, <laughs> you know, um, but I think there's always meaning. <laughs> and maybe yeah, we're yeah. not managing it well. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. for me as a psychiatrist, I, you know, I believe that that every interaction with a patient is a kind of psychotherapy, and yeah, yeah. giving them a medication it has a lot of meaning for patients. And there's a lot of reasons yeah. why people, for the most part, yeah, don't I mean, take uh, their medication. I mean, we know? have to consider that most of the uh, SSRIs are prescribed by general practitioners, not by psychiatrists. I know, I know, but even yeah. even the general practitioner, they have a relationship with the patient too, typically. And I think there's a lot of meaning in that too, right? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, I don't know. I don't want to get too philosophical here, but, you know, physicians going back, like before we had pills, you know, we made, you know, we would just be with people and uh, I don't know, be with them as they died and sort of observed and maybe giving them some information. And I don't know. There, there, there are relationships are really important to all of this um, um, things. But, but getting back to psychedelic psychotherapy, psychedelic psychotherapy, you're, you're doing a very intensive psychotherapy. And then you're giving them people this drug that it does seem to have a particularly powerful induction of uh, meaning. Like people feel like, oh, this is really important somehow. This this is this thing that's going to change my life. It, people have that experience, and I think that good psychedelic psychotherapy is is harnessing that. I think we're trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, I don't I, I don't believe in magic, so I don't think it's spirits in the classic sense of spirits like actual like ghosts but but personal meaning and feeling connected to things and, and a deep you know uh, yeah a deep experience of our our connection that yeah. i think is definitely part of it and and frankly if people want to believe in spirits that also isn't really up to me to, to say so we don't we don't push that we, we don't have any religious icon iconography in our in our dosing room but if you know if someone were to come in and have a religious experience we would go with that and sort of try and help the person through there we wouldn't be like no that's not true you know um and so i don't know if that answers your question about spirituality but um yeah we're, well, we're not, I'm not trying to start a church, I guess is what, what I really want to make clear. Like, I, I don't thank want Thank you for that. clarifying that, Josh. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Um, but other people have churches that, and the sacrament yeah. is a psychedelic compound, and that's fine. That's, that's a different thing. Let's torture Ben with the question. <laughs> so, do you have. I, yeah. I think these, yeah, the, it's, I think it's very possible to have these kinds of experience with a synthetic, a raw mushroom as as well as an extract right um uh so i think really it's just um uh, up to people decide you know what what is their preferred route that they want to take um um and they can they can arrive at it how, however they choose um you know we obviously we're trying to provide the you know the the safest most standardized most repeatable most rep uh, most um um uh uh, quality controlled kind of option for those that prefer a, a, a natural one. Um, 
um, which hopefully would then help contribute to their experience because they know they have a, a safe uh, uh, stand, standardized product and don't uh, have any risk of getting overdose or even worse, the, the, as we talk about with Josh, the dreaded underdose, right? Um, so I, I think, you know, it's possible to, to, to get there with, with either natural or synthetic or a raw mushroom. I think that's the end. <laughs> so thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation a lot and we could go on, of course, and we should go on in the future. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk about natural versus synthetic. We've learned, I have learned a lot of things. I think the audience has enjoyed it and not all questions could have, have been answered, but uh, we'll take it to a later moment uh, in life. Uh, and thank you both for, uh, for this conversation. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Us. Thank you. Yeah. So, bye-bye. Take care.